I spent the last half of this week actually um, down in Las Vegas this week um, saying goodbye to my grandfather. His memorial um, was this week. So um, I just am amazed at what a great church we have because people step up and everything keeps going. And John's been writing a book and I've been taking trip after trip down to uh, visit my grandfather and, and such. And um, yeah, I just, I just am impressed and, and so love this congregation. And um, I honestly thought today we're, today we're going to do a sermon. Uh, we're continuing our series on uh, what it looks like to live beyond our fears. And I thought, man, the fear of death. No one, no one wants to talk about that or think about death at all. And, and here we had a prayer time that just um, sort of set the stage for it. So um, this is a place I was talking to my niece or uh, my cousin, actually, from New York City. And um, I said, you know, nobody talks about death at all. And, um, and I'm going to bring it up at church, and that just feels awkward. And she said, well, it seems to me that church would be the one place that you can talk about it. So that's what I think it is. So I want to start, though, with a, a quick little comic strip. And we'll put it up on the screen. I think it's, it's in there. Um, so it's right here. Unfortunately, I put up the wrong. Fear. Yeah. We're, we're not on the fear of failure. failure. I already failed on that one, so we're going to do And for those of you who can't read it or don't feel like reading it or whatnot, let me uh, kind of voice it over here. So there's a little rabbit fishing, and he says, Hot chocolate to his friend. Do you ever think about death much? And Hot Chocolate, the little gecko, says, or thinks to himself, Rooney, every single waking moment of my life is spent in intense agony, knowing that at any moment it could all suddenly be taken away. And then he answers, nah. <laughs> and as he pulls the fish out of the water, he says, yeah, me neither. <laughs> um, it's a crazy thing when you look at the list of the most prevalent fears that... Uh, impact human beings. The fear of death is usually in the top five. Um, with the internet, it's so hard to find one conclusive list of all this stuff. But yeah, it's always up in the top five, and yet um, we don't talk about it. Um, but I think in the process of talking about it and considering it and addressing it from a faith perspective, there's actually blessings that come out of, out of this topic. So um, living beyond the fear of it is incredibly important. My grandfather, when I was down there um, on his last day, he was um, he wasn't able to speak at that point, and um, yeah, you can take that down. <laughs> um, and he wasn't able to speak at that point. And my brother's a nurse and was really attentive to him, and I, and I was sitting there, um, and and he noticed that his brow had gotten furrowed. He said, "Grandpa, are you in pain?" And he kind of shook his head, no. And then he said, "Are, are you scared?" And he said, "Yeah." He said, are you scared that you're going to die today? He said, yeah. Um, and as I think back, uh, I'm 42. Uh, that was the only time I've ever seen my grandfather scared. This, this fear of death uh, and, and what happens next is, is tremendous. Um, philosopher John Paul Sartre said, um, I might have said that name horribly wrong, but uh, death removes all meaning. That's why we're afraid of it. Aristotle said it's the thing that's most to be feared because it appears to end everything. And every encounter that I have had with death, um, my first reaction is, this isn't right. This isn't how it was supposed to be. Like, something is terribly wrong here. Uh, it's, we're not made for this. This is not, like, I, I just don't buy the whole Pocahontas, this is the circle of life thing. Um, that in Genesis, as it talks about the story of humanity, before the fall ever happened, Adam and Eve are in a garden, and there isn't death there, there's the tree of life. And in Revelation, when you look at the last chapter, after everything has been redeemed and restored to the way that it was created to be, there's no death there. Um, but we live in this world in the in-between, where death is still around, and, uh, and so it feels wrong. And we don't like to think about it, we don't like to talk about it. There was a survey done by the um, Funeral, Funeral Association of America, 
vested interest there in finding out. Um, but they wanted to find out how many people are willing to consider death. And roughly one third of Americans refused to consider their own death. Um, and I remember when Prince died, Christina's first response, the music artist, he's whatever, 50, something like that, he was 50, and uh, he had tremendous resources. And she said, he didn't have a will? How do you not have a will? With that much, and I think it comes down to, we don't like to think about our process dying. Um, and even as we were getting my grandfather's memorial together, uh, my mom's uh, spouse uh, got a call from a co-worker, and she came to me, and, and she, she, neither of them come from a faith background, but she said, I need you to, I need you to pray for someone, and she couldn't even say her name, because she just had a heart for something and they thought she might pass away. Death is the inevitable. It's the last great enemy we face. It's the great fear. And sooner or later, um, in the word of, words of Jim Morrison's autobiography, no one gets out alive, it will come. Um, my other grandfather, not the one who just passed away, but he was a pastor. And I would go over to his house. I wasn't raised in a Christian home, and so we didn't uh, do prayer before bed or prayer before meals or whatnot. And, but I go over to his house, and at his house, we prayed before we went to bed. And I remember we would lean down on our knees next to the bed, and he taught me this prayer as a little kid. And it was, uh, now you lay me down to sleep. <laughs> yes. Pray the Lord, my soul to keep. <laughs> and if I die before I wake, <laughs> pray the Lord, my soul to take. Yes. And... Um, I remember it just freaked me out. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like seven. <laughs> it felt like writing a will. <laughs> okay, well, I, this might be my last night. <laughs> Have I lived a good life? <laughs> but, um, man, as that prayer has sat with me now for... 37 more years, 35 more years. Um, I think there's a lot of wisdom in it. We don't have a guarantee. We only um, get today. And um, the greatest hope that we have of living a life that isn't overshadowed by this fear of death is Christ. Christ being with us and Christ taking us. Um, so that's where we're going to go. Um, why knowing Christ makes a difference as we face uh, our death, either be it our own or somebody else's, and, and how not being afraid of death actually helps us live. So um, I'm going to read for us a good chunk of scripture. The Bible's going to get used a heck of a lot, probably a good thing during a sermon. Um, I'm going to read John chapter 11, though, uh, and we'll start in verse 17, I believe. Yep. Have a Bible and you feel like reading it? Great. If not, I will read it for you here. So, on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Mary and to Martha to comfort them in the loss of their brother. Anyway, uh, Lazarus had gotten sick, and Jesus stayed away for a couple days. He said, I'm going to go when it's the right time, and then, and then he went um, after he had died. And so, verse 21, um, or verse 20, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at the home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ. Son of God, who has come into the world. And after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary. The teacher is here, she said, and he's asking for you. And when Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. 
when the Jews had, who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to go to the tomb to mourn some more. And when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had just been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And Jesus wept. And then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? And Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. And he said, take away the stone. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead men, by this time there's a bad odor and he's been there four days. And then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? And so they took away the stone and then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here that they may believe that you sent me. And then he said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off his grave clothes, let him go. Death brings up uh, tremendous emotions in this story, strong emotions. I picture Martha coming to, to Jesus saying, why didn't you come? Where were you? You stayed back for a couple days. I, I heard that you were close by, but you didn't come. And he was dying. Frustration and anger and abandonment. And I got to tell you, as I encountered death myself this week, those are the feelings. Where was God? Why didn't he just keep my grandpa here a little long? Um, but Jesus' answer is profound. Verse 25. Your brother will rise again. I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. Whoever lives and believes in me will never die. He doesn't answer the question. He doesn't say why he didn't come, why he allowed this. Um, but he makes a promise. And the promise is this. Death does not get the last word. That's the promise. Death is not the last word. You think this is the end, but it is not the end because Jesus himself can conquer death. And then he raises Lazarus as proof of what he just said. And then he was raised himself as proof that that power is so strong. God is a God of life now and in the future. He doesn't allow death to win. Um, though death is universal, though philosophers may say that death is the end, it is not because God is bigger than death. And death can't hold it. So where Martha felt this frustration and abandonment, and Jesus says, I'm bigger than this. Mary's reaction, I feel like, is similar. Lord, why were you? But she doesn't express anger. She grieves. She weeps. She's sad. <coughs> And Jesus looks around and he sees all these other people that are grieving over the loss of Lazarus, his friend. And then he goes to the grave and when he gets there, the shortest and one of the most powerful verses in all the scripture, Jesus wept. Weird. He was about to raise Lazarus from the dead. Like, we're talking 15 minutes, Jesus. Um, but he weeps. And he think he weeps for a very simple reason. He lost a friend. He was separated from his friend. And he knew the pain and the sorrow of that loss. Um, you see, it's not enough that God is powerful and that he can overcome death. The beauty of the gospel is Emmanuel. God with us. Jesus goes with you and I through everything that we face. Every emotion, the frustration of anime, he doesn't say, why do you doubt me? He doesn't attack Martha. 
He doesn't just read a share Mary. He doesn't uh, do that. What he does is he walks with it through them. When I lost my dad, maybe five years ago, um, I made a commitment to myself and to God that I was going to have permission to feel whatever I felt. However I was feeling as I walked through this hard time, um, I was going to allow that to be. And it's amazing how God was there with me in the midst of it. Jesus is with us in every day, every minute. Now, we may not be facing the big giant deep death, but we face little deaths. We face little challenges. We face little struggles. We face little celebrations. We face little victories. And in the midst of all these, Jesus is right there with you, and that is the hope that is bigger than anything this life can throw at us. Psalm 139, uh, 7 through 10. By the way, Psalm 139 is incredible. There are so many parts of this that <coughs> you may have heard again and again, and, and hearing it all together at one time is, is brilliant. So if you get a chance, read Psalm 139. It's, it's wonderful. Um, but let me just read verses 7 through 10. It says, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. And if I make my bed in the depths, by the way, that word depths is Sheol, the place of the dead, where we go when we die. Uh, if I go to the depths, you're there too. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Even there, your right hand will hold me fast. The Lord's hand holds us fast through every single thing that we go through. And because of that, we need not fear death. Um, perhaps one of the greatest chapters on the subject, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, um, incredible passage on uh, the resurrection. I want to read how that chapter ends. So I'm going to read 54 through 58 here. It says this. Um, when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, when the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, but the power of the sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ with us gives us that victory over. <clears throat> Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor for the Lord won't be in vain. We need not fear death because when we're focused on the Lord, we're focused on what is bigger, bigger than death. Um, the other beautiful thing about this uh, is that whatever it is that we have done in the past, whatever it is that we are facing, um, Lazarus was a last lost cause. Jesus was a lost cause when he was dead on a cross. Um, but this incredible power of God to bring things back, to redeem and to restore life, occurs at every level. We're not just talking about death. We're talking about every area of our life that God can restore and reorder and put back the way that it was intended to be. There is nothing too far gone to be raised. I know that for me, there was a time when most people thought I probably wouldn't live to be 25. Um, I very well could have been that person that was texted. I could have been an Ariana. I almost was a dog. Um, here I am. And the life that I have, I can't fathom the joy and the contentment and the peace and what God has done in it. Um, and it's all because God is a God of life who restores and walks with us. Now, the other reason that I think that death was so scary for my grandfather, and if we admit it, um, for us, is that it's kind of the unknown. What happens next? Going to unknown places is a little bit scary. Uh, 
And there's a few stories out there. I know that there's books out there, and I don't know if you're fascinated with them. I have a sister-in-law who loves them. Uh, of people who have like died on the table, and uh, and for a couple minutes, and then um, and it, and I feel like the reports often go something like this. You know, I, I rose from my body, and I could see them working on me. And then there was this tunnel, and I, I went down the tunnel, and there was a, a big bright light, and it was blazing with love and power. And then a voice said. No, it's not your time, and sent me back. Um, and I don't know if that's comforting to you or not. I kind of find it just weird. I don't know if it brings me comfort in my soul to, to hear that. Um, and maybe the reason why is I, I'm, I'm sort of skeptical. Uh, I, I'm sure it was their experience, but I don't get a lot of communication from the other side. And this is one person's medical anomaly sort of deal. Um, and so this journey into unknown territory still creates uh, some uncertainty. In um, Shakespeare's Hamlet, actually, uh, he writes this, The dread of something after death is the undiscovered country from whose board no traveler returns. Um, we need Sherpas in life. We need Sherpas who go ahead of us and have done this. Like, if I go to Mount Rainier and decide I'm going to go up it, you may not have a pastor anymore. Um, I may be with the Lord at that point. But if there's some guy who's gone up Rainier thousands of times and he decides to lead a group, and I decide to go up with him, um, I'll be incredibly sore and tired, but uh, I'll probably be back. There's something about the one who goes before. And... Um, and in Jesus, we have that, that same chapter on uh, the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15, um, really uh, says something powerful here, and I want to read it. It's verses 3 through 8. He says, For what I have received, I pass on to you, and is of the first importance, most important thing. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried, and he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And then he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve, and after that he appeared to more than 500 other brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James and all the apostles, and then also to me, as one abnormally born. Um, a lot of witnesses. And when Paul wrote this, I don't know if you caught it in there, some of them have fallen asleep, but many are still here. You can go talk to them. And, and Jesus wasn't one who sort of died on a table and got sent back. I mean, this was the crucifixion. Romans knew what they were doing. Uh, and he was three days in a tomb. Uh, so Jesus comes back and appears to all these people um, and verifies this. And then when you combine that with what Jesus says in John 14, he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. In other words, don't be afraid. Trust in God. Trust also in me, because in my Father's house there are many rooms, and if it weren't so, I would have told you. I'm going there. I'm going to prepare a place for you, and if I go prepare a place for you, I will come back, and I will take you with me so that you can be where I am. We don't face this unknown. It's unknown to us. We're not facing it with somebody who doesn't know it. Jesus is the one who has gone ahead. And so, um, it's a little bit more like stepping forward into a new life instead of stepping into the unknown. Uh, when you were born, you did not know how the world would be. And yet, your mother was there. And you were born. And you stepped into this new world, and it was probably a lot bigger and a whole lot better than just inside your mama's belly. <laughs> and I think that because of what Jesus says, and because of who Jesus is, and because of the fact that we will enter a place where there is no more sin and brokenness, it will be like that, stepping into wide open places. Um, there's a book that we've uh, been that I've been using a lot as we've um, considered this series, and it's by uh, John uh, Westfall's mentor, Bruce Larson. It's a great book. It's um, Living Beyond Fear, which is how I got the title, but I didn't know it at the time. But um, anyways, he shares the story of Bishop Warren Chandler, and on his death, um, 
A friend of his asked him, are you, are you dreading crossing over the river of death? And his reply was this, why would I worry? My father owns both sides of the river. <laughs> why should I be afraid? C.S. Lewis, when he lost his mentor and friend, said, you know, heaven's no longer a strange place for me. Um, it's not a far off place because now I have a friend there. In Christ, we don't need to fear death um, or the loss of loved ones uh, because we know that Christ can bring us with them. There is grief, there is sorrow, it doesn't end the emotions that go with it, but Christ walks with us through those as well. It does create one problem, though, theologically for me, a problem, and it's a communication problem, smaller problem, but a communication problem. This book definitely creates a communication problem. Uh, Luke 16, there's this parable of the rich man and Lazarus, and the rich man wants to go back and warn his family that they should live differently than he did. And um, they say, you know what? That's not going to happen. You're already dying. My dad would call me on Saturday mornings, and when I would go out early to go do stuff, um, he made sure to call even earlier. So my family grew up with my dad calling at 6 a.m. Christina loved that, by the way. <laughs> um, when we didn't have the whole cell phone thing yet. So he would call at 6 a.m. And since he passed, I haven't gotten a phone call at 6 a.m. on Saturdays. So my dad loved to do Habitat for Humanity. I don't think he's worked on any projects, though, since he passed away. Uh, at one point in his battle with cancer, he had a successful surgery. He got some of it. Um, he was still really weak, or sick, weak and sick, but he made it to his next birthday. And I remember him getting up at that birthday party and preaching. My dad was not a preacher. Um, and he preached, and he said, you know what? You have got to use every day to its fullest. You've got to tell the people that you love, that you love them. You've got to uh, make amends where you need to make amends. And he had this fire in his belly to live life as fully as he possibly could and to seize every day for what it was possibly worth. Um, and I think when we avoid death, when we push off the side and don't want to think about it, we lose our ability to do that. Luke 12, 16 through 21 tells this parable of a, a rich man, another rich man, lots of rich men, um, who is getting a lot of stuff. He's prospering, and so he's like, man, i got to build a bigger barn. And so he goes, i got this plan. I'm going to tear down this barn, and then I'm going to build a bigger barn, and that way I can put my stuff in there, and then I'll have room for even more stuff. <laughs> and uh, then God shows up that night and says, you fool. Tonight your life is forfeit. You're going to die. And Jesus sends the parable with these words. This is the whole point of that weird story. This is how it will be for anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich towards God. There is a fear that is worse than dying, and it is this. Fear of wasting your life. That is my greatest fear. If I get to the end of my life and I look around and I go, what did I do with my years? Man, I'm just wasted. We have a non-renewable resource each day, a gift from God that we wouldn't have had without his help. How will we use it? And when I walk into my last day, I'm going to look around. I don't know when that day will come. Hopefully it'll be in a long ways off. We don't get a 90-day notice near as I can tell. But when that day comes, I want to look around and go, man, I did what I could. I made the world a better place. I shared something of eternity with some other folks, so there's something more than just this life. Um, so what is it that you need to do? Who do you need to call? Who do I need to call? Who do I need to make peace with? What adventure has God been calling me towards? What thing do I need to get started? Because my tendency, and I'm betting that you can resonate with this stuff, is to go, well, Next year, there'll be a little more space and a little more time. Or in five years, things will be better situated to do that. <coughs> and I think the importance that we get when we live beyond the fear of death is this. And that is, do it now. Live full now. Live rich towards God now. Because now is all you have. 
It reminds me of a song, a very cheesy country song, but I like cheesy country songs, so. Tim McGraw, uh, Live Like You're Dying, I named the sermon after it. And it's a story about this guy who, who at 40 gets uh, a terminal uh, diagnosis. And he asks him, how does that hit you? And he says, well, uh, I did this. And he starts listing off all these things. Of, I went skydiving, and I rode a bull. And my, that is nowhere on my list. <laughs> my bucket list will be just fine without bull riding. Uh, but, he, but he loves deeper, and he speaks sweeter, and he offers forgiveness, and then he, he reads the Bible more. But as I listen to that song, that list feels incomplete to me. Because it's mostly about living rich towards yourself. Um, what about who he could have served? What could he have done with his resources? Um, one of my joys of the last few years has been the fact that I took lots of opportunities to go travel and visit my grandpa. Um, but I had the opportunity to sit with him, and I, I read uh, John chapter 11. To him. And we, uh, as he was dying, I, I got to read about the hope of the resurrection. But my hope is that as we kind of uh, move into this next week, as we consider this next month, that we remember two things. One, God is with us, um, and he goes with us through everything, and nothing is beyond his power. And the second thing is that we only have today. So live full, live like you're dying, live rich towards God, and let the Lord lead us. Sound like fun? Let's pray. <laughs> God, thank you that we need not fear uh, death. So, Lord, help us to focus on life. Help us to focus on you and you being our source of life. Walk with us through what we walk through. Even when we feel like you're not there and you have left us, Lord, may we put our trust in you and live richly towards you because we know that you are doing a great thing. So, God, impact this world for our lives. Thank you for this community of faith. Thank you for the love that is shown here, for the, the foretastes of heaven that we get to taste when we come here. May we also spread those foretastes of heaven um, as we go about our week. We love you, Lord. Amen.